Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice. May it please the Court. My name is Miles McDonough. With me is my colleague, uh, Christopher Riley. Your Honor, we represent the defendant appellant AIG domestic claims. We're seeking a ruling from this Court directing that the denial of summary judgment in the Court below uh, be vacated and that an order issue requiring the entry of summary judgment in favor of AIG DC on either subject matter uh, jurisdiction or other uh, immunity grounds which are, we've asserted. Mr. McDonough, I, I appreciate the fact that you think that the appeals court decision was incorrectly decided with respect to the anti-slap statute, but with respect to just the facts that are set forth in that opinion, do you disagree factually with those Oh, facts? very much so, Your Honor, very much so. Which ones? Um, can I just pick out a few, Your Honor? There are, there are many. Uh, first of all, there's a suggestion that the appeals court did not discern from the record, and I know the record now with summary judgment is a little more extended than it was before, but the appeals court could not discern any reason why in the record Mr. Maxwell had pleaded guilty. Uh, there was a, there's a plethora of facts upon which that, that guilty plea makes imminent sense. Um, he, Mr. Maxwell not only denied that he was actually working on the very day that he was observed working down at the you, Quincy but, shipyard. But do, do you say that, that that wasn't part of the program that came out of the YMCA? No, I say that because he was physically working on the, under the, um, the, the, uh, the Sorrentos case from the appeals court, his denial of having worked in and of itself, and let's put aside the wage issue that I'll get to, is in and of itself a grounds upon which to suspect that fraud might be afoot. Under Section 34, Your Honor, um, there are reasonable grounds to suspect that when somebody is physically working and they report that they are not working on an 11 I'm washing days, the dishes and I report I'm not working, that would be enough? Working, out, working uh, at a workplace, Your Honor, where somebody is observed to be doing physical work uh, he was doing mopping. He was doing uh, he admitted as part his of deposition. A program, correct. I'm sorry, Your Honor. As part of a program. As part of maybe a program, maybe a job. There's an issue as to what the wages. Uh, excuse me, as to whether or not the stipend constituted wages or not. The Ma actually, there's no, there is no issue. The, the governing case is the McIntyre case from the reviewing board, and that the reviewing board says, which should be the controlling law here, says that a stipend is wages, even if you don't pay taxes on it. So, so you're, you're saying, I take it, that um, it, it, he, he should have disclosed it. He may have had a perfectly good explanation for right. it, but he had to disclose it. Yes, I, I don't know that he had a perfectly good explanation. Well, he might. I, it was wage, in our view, it was wages as a matter of law, Your Honor, but even so, yes, I agree. That's, that's what I'm saying. You don't disagree that he had a rotator cuff injury, do you? Um, no, Your Honor, I think there but was. But you didn't pay compensation, did you? Uh, there was compensation paid, Your Honor. There was, but there was not, but after a conference, right? Yes, Your Honor, it was a contested claim. Uh, yes, but the, the orders were followed in terms of what, would, what was ordered under the um, process, the, the regular process and the regular course. So just going back to Your Honor's question, uh, Justice Blasford's question, let me rattle off a little bit more about what the factual record discloses here. In addition to denying that he was working when he was, and therefore arguably he was hiding an earning capacity, which would be fraud under Section 34 of the statute for February, March, and April, he collected temporary total benefits when he had a work, arguably had a working capacity. In addition to that, um, he denied any wages when he had the stipend, which under Sally McIntyre is wages, even if you don't pay taxes on it. He denied any prior claims when he, his answers to interrogatory show that he had two prior workers' compensation claims. He denied that he had any prior injuries when his answers to interrogatories given in the underlying 93A case here disclosed that, in fact, he had two prior motor vehicle accidents. That may well, th th those are just some examples. There was plenty there to convict the gentleman of workers' compensation fraud in Larcy for, no, for over $250. If, if um, I'm going to phrase my, my question generally, if an insurer um, uh, uh, denies a claim um, based on facts that has, it has conjured up in bad faith, what are the consequences within the, the, the statutory framework for the Industrial Accident Board? Uh, uh, penalties, there's adjudication, there's specific remedies for that, Your Honor. Section 14.1 talks about uh, uh, assertion of claims or defenses on unreasonable grounds. Uh, the regulation, Your Honor, discussed in the Fleming uh, case, 452 CMR 7043A, 
is spot on in this case. The allegations here are that there were misrepresentations of fact by the carrier, yeah. the insurer concerning Mr. Maxwell's claim. And what are the consequences? Uh, penalties under Section 7 and... Double uh, benefits under 14? Um, I, I'd have to go and check you the statute. You pay the cost of the proceeding and you... Um, there, there is double back. Double, ba double benefits. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and by something under other sections, there's something times 6, 2 or 3, 14, 2 or 3. Yes, Your Honor. Um, but just another point that Your Honor's question has sparked a memory for me on with regard to the record... Um, there were also eight witnesses prepared to testify at trial, but the, and there was also information provided by the employer to the workers' compensation carrier uh, that just nine days before uh, the date of accident, October 8, 2000, nine days before that, September 29, I gather, or thereabouts, the, uh, Mr. Maxwell complained of back pain and left work. Um, for, and, and the information provided by the employer was that the explanation was it was unrelated to work. But, but, but there is a, there is a, a, a remedy uh, for insurer misconduct. But what about wrongful prosecution, well, malicious well, prosecution? Uh, that was, is that remedied under the Section 14.1? Yeah, the, 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 the point here under, um, well, let me, let me address that in terms of the exclusivity and subject matter jurisdictions, if I may, because I think that's how it ties in here. Um, first of all, the overarching statutory scheme wraps everything up uh, that is within the ambit of Chapter 152. And now, since 1991 at the latest, these sorts of measures that were taken by the carrier here, anti-fraud measures, challenging under Section 14.2 before the DIA, um, writing to the district attorney for assistance with regard to potential uh, suspension of benefits by reason of, of uh, possibility of surrender, asking for help. Of the, uh, from the district attorney under sub, uh, chapter 152 section 7 paragraph 3 and the cognate the related statutes under 276 and 279 going to the probation department and asking the probation department for help to have a discussion about the fact that Mr. Maxwell who by then had pleaded guilty and was simply not paying the $9,000 a month restitution asking them for help all of this all of this every piece of conduct in this case those are the the investigation and the reporting, those are the four pieces of conduct complained of. They are all directly statutorily uh, related and tied in with Chapter 152 activity. So they fall under Fleming exclusivity. Also, they further the purposes under Bodak and, and, and uh, Kelly, even if the conduct is vexatious, they further the purposes uh, and are, are subject to exclusivity and immunity under Section 24 under Kelly and Bodak. Um, there is, um, and, and also um, there's a waiver here, a release under Section 23 automatically. Those four, t those four pieces of conduct and the related correspondence to, to claimants' counsel giving him notice that this is what was going to, going to be pursued. All of that conduct uh, arises from, under Section 23, arises from Mr. Maxwell's bodily injury because arises from has to be interpreted broadly as it is under Tatro. It, and under it, it, it arises from your activities. It, which arise from Mr. Maxwell's. Your Honor, this is At what some Tatro, point, there's got to be a line drawn between them. It, no, Your Honor, respectfully, the answer is, at least if Tatro is applied here, and Tatro is the personal jurisdiction statute, which yes. is to be interpreted broadly, this is employee exclusivity under and under Berger, it is to be but interpreted broadly. But what about broadly. Foley versus Polaroid? Some Foley of those versus claims, Polaroid is not a fraud claim, Your Honor. It's not an anti... It's but a, you're talking about... One piece of this relates to the, to the IFB. One piece of this relates to what's subsumed under 14, right? Under 14? Under Section 14. Your Honor, my point about Section 14 is it's simply... It's a clear remedy for, for this case within... The DIA. Oh, if that's the case, Foley, then why would why would Foley not also fall under Section Foley, 14? Nobody accused Mr. Foley of fraud. He was accused of rape. It has nothing to do with no, this but, case. No, but this. his claim, his claim of of malicious prosecution. Bait, my, that's this is my point, Your Honor. M whether you can call it malicious prosecution or abusive process or intentional affliction of, of emotional distress. No, dress those up, are three different things. Dress it up as any tort Your Honor prefers. It doesn't matter because the legislative intent now is clear and has been since 1991 at least that within the, the uh, immunities of Chapter 152, 
is anti-fraud conduct. It's an immune, uh, act, these are immune actions. Um, and now, that's where now, Kelly. Now, the uh, 1990 statute says, in the absence of malice or bad faith, no insurer shall be subject to civil liability for damages by reason of having made that report. The 96 statute, Your Honor? Yeah. Yes, so, Your Honor. If I, if I could. Right. Is, uh, it, is, it your, is it your view that even with malice and bad faith, there is no civil liability, that the, that, that the person is now limited to the remedies under the Workers' Compensation Act? Uh, the short answer is yes, but I want to explain that um, with reference to the statute's language itself. Here, what we have is uh, conduct which, as a matter of law, the four pieces, those four pieces of conduct that are complained of here, as a matter of law, they are not tortious. They're not tortious because they're mandated under loss control, the, uh, the loss, loss control mandate of Chapter 175, Section 4, the NAIC materials that we refer to in the briefs, the standards, you have to have documentation to justify payment. All that mandatory stuff applies here. And, and the very clear examples are the reporting statute. It's, it's mandatory I understand to report. that, but this, the statute recognizes that even that reporting could be done with malice and in bad faith. But, you know, if, if, the, if it's a mandatory uh, report. Okay, so you're saying that there can be, a, if the, or, the, or there can be no malice or bad faith made. No, I, I'm saying it, it's it's immaterial in this sense because the, if the legislature defines the mandated report, if the legislature says you have to report when there's any reasonable ground to suspect fraud may have happened, and that's what we have here. There is no discretion. You have to do. If you're the comp carrier, you have to report. The legislature does not set people up for uh, even insurance companies up for pratfalls and say. We're going to command that you report in these circumstances which we have here, but then we're going to let you be subjected to liability but on you only the have thesis. Now, but you're only required to report when you have reason to believe. Exactly, which okay. we have here. So certainly if you have reason, but the claim I assume would be that you did not have reason to believe but and we, acted with, in well, bad faith and with malice. But for the facts I've just articulated, plus the fact that the gentleman pleaded that's, guilty, that's a, But, the, but that's, that's a different question. Case. That's saying you disagree that there was a reasonable question of fact. No, no, no. I'm saying, well, no, there is no question of fact. I don't think that there's a reasonable question of fact on the operative question of whether or not there was reasonable grounds to believe fraud may have occurred. No, but that's, that's what Judge Giles found, correct? No, if, if, if she had found that there were reasonable grounds to believe that fraud may have occurred, I, I think we would be out of this case. But, but what, if, no, what, what if the insurance company didn't like this guy? In, in, I'm not talking about AIG. If an insurance company didn't like the, the claimant and just made the whole thing up, no reason to believe. With, right. with the language in the statute, 1990, the absence of malice or bad faith, doesn't that suggest that there is a common law tort uh, and that the, the, uh, this is not a, an exclusive self-contained statute? The way, the way it harmonizes is this, Your Honor. As to there is no need for an immunity for mandated, socially desirable, mandated, legislatively mandated conduct. It is not a tort as a matter of law, number one. Therefore, the question is, where does that, how do you harmonize that statutory language? The only rational way to apply it is for people who don't have reasonable cause to believe, but nonetheless make a report. We have reasonable cause to believe here all over the place. Okay. It, so that's why it serves a useful purpose. That's why, how you harmonize the statute. Also, as I say, it, it is there's an absurdity. It, it's an absurdity to say that um, that should apply to people who already are mandated to report uh, be, for the reason I, I referred to before, it's absurd to ascribe to the legislature an intent to make people do things and then have them subjected to suit for doing it in a supposedly malicious but, but, way. But it's one thing to say that there's immunity if, if you have reasonable cause to make the statement. It's another thing to say that Chapter 152 creates the, the, uh, a comprehensive statutory scheme that provides the exclusive um, remedies for, right, and there are alternative, there are alternative arguments I'm making here, Your Honor. But but to go, stick with the reporting statute for a moment. I believe the proper way to read it is what I just said in terms of harmonizing the immunity with the mandatory conduct. But alternatively, you could say, if somebody does have a man is in that realm where they have mandatory reporting requirements, as a matter of law, that is good faith. That's another way to reconcile okay. it. Um, real quick on the uh, duty to investigate. But then, why would you need the language absence of malice or bad faith? 
to protect people who don't have, uh, don't have reasonable grounds to believe. They don't even have grounds for a suspicion. But that fits into the immunity approach. It doesn't fit into the alternative. It, it, the, the alternative explanation doesn't seem to address the absence of malice and bad faith. No, I'm saying as a matter of law, the alternative is you cannot have, uh, even if, if you, you have good faith as a matter of law, therefore no malice, therefore you're protected uh, if you have reasonable grounds to believe that fraud may have occurred. Um, Your Honor, as I see my time is fast approaching, if I just briefly conclude. Uh, yes, you may Ten briefly seconds, conclude. Your Honor. If these yes. cases are upheld, the appeals court decision, the superior court decision, then uh, the, two, the legislative, legislative intent is going to be defeated, number one, by chilling the anti-fraud measures that we've discussed in the brief, and number two, undermining the cornerstone of workers' comp immunity and exclusivity every time there's a fraud, potential fraud issue in a case. Thank you very much, Thank you, Ronis. Counsel. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court, I'm Chester Tennis, and I represent Mr. Maxwell. Uh, I suppose I should start about the exclusivity uh, provisions of the Workers' Compact. Can I, start First you Can I start you somewhere else? Yes. And that is here. Let's assume that <clears throat> we conclude, I don't speak for anyone, but let's assume we conclude that indeed the company had immunity uh, with regard to the reporting that it made to the Fraud Bureau and the subsequent criminal prosecution. Okay. What's left of your case? Everything. Tell uh, me why. Because, here's why. Because the uh, immunity statute, uh, Chapter 427 of the Acts of uh, 1996, provide a qualified immunity but only for one act, and that act is in the reporting of the incident or the, the circumstances to the Insurance Fraud Bureau. Okay. And that's really where this case begins because uh, AIG didn't stop there. Once the criminal process issued and Mr. You said it caused the criminal process. Your complaint is, I read your, it's right. you, that they caused the criminal complaint to issue. That's your, that's your complaint. That's, they caused that's, it to issue. That, that's part of it, Your Honor. But that, uh, isn't that exactly what the immunity statute is designed? You, you refer it to the Fraud Bureau. They investigate it, make a recommendation. The prosecutor makes a judgment to bring it, and now you are liable for having caused it? The facts don't stop there. What AIG did once the criminal process issued is they used the, the fact that a criminal prosecution had initiated to try to influence Mr. Maxwell to, number one, withdraw his workers' compensation claim. Uh, when he didn't withdraw the claim, they uh, used it to try to convince him to settle the claim for one dollar. Uh, when, uh, uh, when that wasn't accomplished, AIG went to the DIA judge and informed her, Mr. Maxwell's been uh, charged with workers' comp fraud. We'd Perfectly like appropriate. How, how is that not appropriate? And, the, and there was a proceeding. Well, the, the and it was found in your, in, your fa in your client's favor, and there were remedies. She didn't impose the remedies that she could have imposed, did she? There would, he was already receiving workers' compensation benefits. There would be no remedy to impose. I thought you said he hadn't received his medical payments. Or no, no, no. Uh, by the time that the criminal prosecution was commenced, Mr. Maxwell had been ordered to be paid workers' compensation benefits. Mm -hmm. He became homeless before the conference took place. But the conference before Judge Diesti, she ordered the payment of workers' compensation benefits. Right. At that proceeding, he was asked to fill out a wage reporting statement. As the law requires, yes. Uh, it doesn't actually require it, but it's a right that the insurer has to ask the, the employee okay. to Okay, and you're not saying there's anything wrong with that. Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, but the truth of the matter is he correctly and accurately filled out that statement. He stated that he had not received any earnings uh, in the six months before the incident took place. That is factually and legally correct. When he became a... a um, he got a stipend, and it was $375 a week. Yes, uh, and it was made okay. clear to him when he went to the homeless shelter that he had to participate in the program, that he would receive a stipend. It was not earnings. He was not an employee. He would not be eligible for unemployment when the, when the training was over. It was limited duration, and it was being offered through HUD. Now, factually, everything that he was told was correct. If we look at the Internal Revenue Code, uh, payments made under these circumstances are not earnings, and the training program is not considered employment. 
The Commonwealth of Massachusetts takes the very same position. It's not earnings, it's not employment. So everything that Mr. Maxwell said, completing the earnings statement, was absolutely correct. But really important in this case, I think, is what the defense would like us to do is to read this, uh, this statute, uh, Chapter 427 of the Acts of 1996, to say that no matter what uh, an insurer does after they make the initial report that they are immune. And that's not what the statute says. So, so point out precisely, they, after, you're, I, if you agree with me, that in fact the issuance of the criminal complaint, there was no liability with respect to that. They didn't cause that to happen. At least if they caused it, it was within the immunity. What did they do after the complaint was issued? They tried to settle the underlying case because they felt that if he's indicted for fraud, they were going to bring a challenge, as they had a right to do, to his continued receipt? First of all, I don't necessarily agree that they had the right to initiate the, uh, well, the if it was unre process. If it was unreasonable, then the, the workers' comp statute says there are penalties for an unreasonable assertion of a ground by an insurance company. However, if we follow that logic, that means that the tort of a malicious prosecution or abusive process, misuse of the criminal process, no longer exists in this commonwealth. And how is the criminal process misused here exactly? Here, uh, the, the fact that the criminal prosecution had commenced was used to try to influence Mr. Maxwell to drop his workers' compensation claim. In, in, in what way? You've been indicted. You've been accused of fraud. We are going to bring we are going to bring an action, as we have a right to do, before the DIA saying that your benefits should be stopped and that we should get our money back. We won't bring that action if you settle this case. We'll settle it for a dollar. I How think, is that a misuse of process? Well, first of all, I think that is. I think that's the, that's the definition of abuse of process. That's the definition of settlement. And also the tort of abuse of process. But here... Why is it the tort of abuse of process? Where is... I don't think you if can... The, if the criminal prosecution didn't have a reasonable ground. And you're, well, you're saying, that, but, you're, but you're saying that they should have... They, they had an obligation to check some of this stuff out. Absolutely. Right? Well, when did they actually find out that he was, he was involved in a program... Uh, in, in which he legally was not working and not receiving pay? They found out for the first time that we know of in June of 2001 when Community Work Services provided the records uh, concerning the program. And we know... And where did that fit in the timeline of, uh, with respect to the, the, the events that we're, we've been talking about? Sure. Okay. I mean, the work injury was in, in, in 2000. 2001, they're aware of the materials from Community Work Services. Uh, in December of 2001. He is charged criminally with workers' compensation fraud. In April of 2002, there's a hearing at the Department of Industrial Accidents, and the director of the program actually testified that Mr. Maxwell received a stipend. It wasn't wages. He was not an employee. The criminal prosecution continued after that. As a matter of fact, in August of 2003, the adjuster from AIG met with the prosecutor, and by this time, the adjuster from AIG knew that Mr. Maxwell had not received wages, it was not employment, it was a training program, and she did not disclose that fact to the prosecutor. Because wages is not the issue. That's one well, earnings, earnings. Earnings is the issue. Earnings is the issue. That's wages correct. aren't the issue. Right. And under the Internal Revenue Code, these were not earnings. They were not earnings. Not, not taxable earnings. in any respect. I'm not, not talking tax about withholding tax. Not taxable. It was simply... It says not earnings. Under the Internal Revenue Code, these are not considered earnings, and this is not employment. Purposes of withholding and FICA. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, specify don't, the purpose. You do not pay income taxes on them, correct? That's correct. There's no W-2. There's no 10, 1099, no Social Security, uh, no unemployment. So under, it, it just not, simply what Mr. Maxwell said is absolutely correct. Wasn't earnings, uh, he, he hadn't had any earnings. He's got a defense. He's got a defense, maybe, to some of this. I still have a hard, I have a hard time getting past yeah. the fact that AIG is trying to use this statute, which only protects them from reporting from all the other things that occurred afterwards including the trying to settle the trying to settle the dispute or whether or he was when properly. they knew facts that that should have undermined the, the criminal prosecution Ab they were aware of those facts by that time where of which facts the facts that he wasn't making he didn't have earnings 
he shouldn't have been criminally prosecuted. So, so your, your argument then is that if a witness possesses exculpatory information and fails to reveal it to the prosecution, that that witness can be sued for malicious prosecution and abusive process? I, I'm not sure if that's true or not, Your Honor, but I will say this, now that you brought it up, there was testimony from the investigator from AIG, Tito uh, Medeiros, that uh, formerly worked for the Insurance Fraud Bureau, and he said that it was absolutely required by the Insurance Fraud Bureau that if the insurance company or its representatives came into uh, possession of information that would suggest that the initial determination was not correct, they had to disclose it. That wasn't done here. Okay, Ms. but but try my question. Are you saying then that the, that a witness put aside AIG that when a witness right. has exculpatory information? with regard to a criminal prosecution and fails to reveal to the prosecutor that that witness, that that's a cause of action against the witness for abusive process and for malicious prosecution? Someone who's purely a witness. I don't think so. Okay, so how does AIG, how is AIG different than, in the, in with, with regard to the criminal prosecution, because than either as a witness or as somebody who's providing information to the prosecutor? Because AIG's actions didn't stop with just that initial report. And I think that's really the sum and substance of Judge Giles' ruling in this case. There's a genuine issue of material fact as to whether or not the defendant in this case acted in the absence of malice or bad faith. That's not exactly what she says. She says there's a, an issue of fact as to whether they conducted a reasonable investigation. And if you look at the briefs by Amicus, they're very concerned about what that means. Does that mean companies now have this reasonable investigation obligation in addition to reason to believe? Well, the, the reason to believe has to be based on, based on fact. Mm -hmm. uh, some inquiry must be made. It can't be supposition or a hunch. Right. And, I think that's what, and I think that's what the judge is getting at here is that is a question of fact in this case. So you're suggesting to me there was, there was no reason to believe here, no reason to believe that there was a fraud. Yes, I, what I'm suggesting is- That there is, might have been a fraud. I'm sorry? No reason to believe that there might have been a fraud. No reasonable grounds, that's not what it says. Right. Reason, anyone, anyone who has reason to believe that there may be a fraud occurring or about to occur shall report to the Bureau in charge of investigating such allegations. There was no, what the judge found here, I believe, is that there is a question of fact as to whether there was reason to believe. As to whether a reasonable investigation was conducted. Isn't that what she says? Well, I don't know. Let me take, I'm, I'm just taking a. <laughs> Let's see. There is a legitimate factual dispute as to whether the defendant had satisfied its duty of reasonable investigation so as to support it, a reason to believe. So there's now, there's a duty of reasonable investigation. Some inquiry, and I, I think that's consistent. Certainly there was some inquiry done here. He was followed, he was working. He filled out a form saying, I'm not working. And he wasn't working. He was either. working. No. Is, is it, he, was a training program? He, was he there, working or not working? He was not working. He that, was, that is not employed. He was not employed, was he working? He is going through a training program. As a matter of fact, the testimony from the director of the program is that this is a program chiefly for the homeless. These are people who... I understand the, the facts here are terrible in that sense, but was he... He was followed. He went to work. He went to work the next morning. He was do, performing functions for, a, for an institution. He was performing training, Your Honor. This was never described as employment. This is not anything like a full-time job or even a part-time job. I thought, he, I thought he was working weekly. He got $375 a week. He, he was paid a stipend through HUD. That's correct. But there is nothing to suggest that this is earnings or wages. And, and that's a separate it's, issue. But, it, it, but it's tr two different forms two different, for different reasons. One, are you making income? That affects what kind of... Uh, stipend you might get, and are you working anywhere affects whether you're able to work. But if it is a two different it, forms. But if it's a sheltered workshop setting, and that's what this is. This I understand is you may have a very interesting defense, but the question is: there reason to believe that this person may be about to engage in a fraudulent act? And then it gets referred to a bureau set up specially to investigate such allegations. I, I understand, Your Honor. And all but of again, the, we, the, the only way we, 
I, I, I don't see how we can, we can ignore everything that AIG did after the initial report. They were aware that it wasn't earnings. They were aware it was a training program. They attempted to use the, use the process to coerce Mr. Maxwell to drop the claim, to settle the claim. Went to, when they went to the probation officer, it wasn't the probation officer on this case, the fraud case. They went to a probation officer. Mr. Maxwell was on probation for an older drug violation. And what AIG asked of the probation officer is, can't you surrender him on this unrelated charge so at least we can stop paying him? I think that creates a genuine issue of fact as to the motives, whether there was malice uh, or good faith on the part of AIG. And I, I, I submit that on that basis alone, summary judgment was properly denied. What, what's his status now? He is uh, living in Boston. Uh, What's the status disabled. of his, what, what did Judge Desty, what, what came out of that? Well, what happened was uh, he was cleared of any fraud. Right. Uh, Mr. He was Mac cleared? I'm sorry. Yes, he was found, it, it was found, uh, no, well, I'm talking about two different things. And the, uh, Judge Desty's decision was that Mr. Maxwell had not committed fraud. Uh, the, the criminal case was then reopened and was Noel Prost. Um, I'm not sure if I answered is he, your Is he getting, did, did he get no, any, as a matter did he fact, get any, what, no. what did Judge DST, did he get any benefits from that? No additional benefits, no. Uh, he, he, he continued to get what he was getting. He then attempted to go back to work somewhere else. Uh, it was a failed attempt and. But, but were, were his benefits uh, terminated or reduced in any way as a result of his having participated and performed physical labor in conjunction with this particular program? No, no. Was it ever made the subject of, of, a, of a hearing before yes. the IAB? Yes, oh absolutely. And the director of the program testified uh, at, at the hearing exactly what Mr. Maxwell's participation was, uh, what the stipend consisted of, and uh, it wasn't in any way offset from uh, what he received in workers' compensation benefits. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you.